In this series of conversations, we'll be discussing the impact of our global food systems on our health and the health of our environment with guests who bring a deep understanding of the challenges facing our society and creative ideas on how to address them. I'm Ash Sweeting and welcome to The Ash Cloud. Today we are joined by Annaline Padayachi, a nutrition scientist at the University of Queensland who's been studying the relationships between our food systems and our behaviour on the nutrient density of our diets and how this impacts our health and the health of our microbiome. We know that nutrition is not just about weight loss and body image, but nutrient density in food is absolutely essential. It is the fuel that that fuels our bodies. There are no shortcuts when it comes to food quality and nutrient density. Like the actual quality of the food. And that starts all the way on farm. You know, so how we feed that cow or the, the fertilizer in the soil, um, the water supply, or, you know, you've even got fermenters. So the really cool high tech ways of, of producing food. Processing is not innately a bad thing. Processing in itself is a technology, it's an enabler. It's the formulations that are usually the conundrum. Human health and soil health are connected. The impact of organic farming is definitely better for the soil's microbial count. And that will eventually lead on to affecting the quality of nutrients in foods over a long period of time. Colour is key when it comes to good nutrition. For everybody... 50% 50% plants, a quarter whole grain, a quarter protein, and mostly plants, any color. So when you're looking at your plants, if you've got some green, got some red, got some orange, got some purple, got some white, you've covered all your bases. The opposite is also the case. And if it is in lots of packaging and it doesn't have much dietary fiber and it doesn't have much color and everything looks fairly similar like a muesli bar looks pretty much the same color as a cookie which looks pretty much the same color as a muffin which doesn't look very dissimilar to a burger bun um okay then we've got we've got a slight problem here and you don't need me to tell you that we cannot afford to ignore the microbiome your gut microbiome is like a little baby it's a little person who lives inside your colon there's millions of them and they all have personality they have emotions they like certain foods as well um so if it's good if it's healthy for you it's going to be healthy for them and the reason for eat mostly plants is because it's an amazing source of dietary fiber and your gut microbiome doesn't have the privilege of choosing its preferred meal of choice. And dietary fiber is its preferred meal of choice. <laughs> we do know that the gut microbiome is affected from in utero. So what your mom eats affects you. Um, what your grandmother eats affects you. Think long term. What you do now is setting your body up for tomorrow, it is setting your body up for five years down the track. It is setting your body up for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years down the track. And it also is going to affect your future children. Annaline, thank you so very much for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Ash. So there's a lot of talk nowadays about processed foods, uh, especially ultra processed foods the potential health benefits, potential environmental benefits. Can you just start with a, a bit of background in terms of food processing, the good, the bad, and the ugly? Yeah, 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 yeah. So food processing does get a lot of bad rap in the media. And, so you know, there's a lot of justifiable reasons as well. But how we got here is very important to, to, to consider to begin with. Um, so when we look at the iterations of the food revolutions over history. The first one was the agricultural revolution with the ancient Egyptians and how they actually started planting crops on the banks of the river. So they had a stable water supply and they could grow mass crops because up until that time, it was very much so based on seasonality. And whatever we grew, we ate it at that little time, we stored it and tried to get through to the next wet season. So they had a steady water supply. They could grow crops almost all year round. And that is what actually helped their population to grow. Now, I'm not saying it was nutrient dense at all because a lot of the ancient Egyptians died in their early 40s, but at least they had a stable food supply the entire year. So that's better than going through periods of of famine or, or food insecurity. And that type of new way of farming 
kind of spread for eons of years. And it was the way that the food supply was viewed, just in terms of having stability and no food insecurity, until the 1700s when the food when the industrial revolution started happening. And so now we've got machinery being used to create food. We've got Louis Pasteur and his team, you know, discovering microbes. And so the technologies that we were using, things like drying, retorting, canning, um, heat, any sort of heat treatment, pasteurization was very much so fixated on destroying microbes that were being discovered and preserving shelf life to get, you know, we're talking about an era where people didn't have refrigerations. They didn't really understand food safety that much either. And nutrition was still not really well established as a science. So that was the driver. Nutrition as a science is only about 220 years old. So we're very young, um, you know, discovering what a vitamin is and, and those sort of things. And so way back when nutrition was as a science was discovered, the whole aim was trying to work out what causes micronutrient deficiency. So if I don't have vitamin C, what's the disease I will get? Scurvy, my teeth fall out. This, well, let's give this, the, the, salt, the, the sailors lemons. Um, if we don't have iron, you've got a disease called anemia. That's kind of where the mindset was. But at the same time, we have this you know, industrial revolution type mentality to the food world. By the 1950s, however, things started changing again for the food world, and that was when automation started entering. So um, the car sector was automating. They were mass-producing cars. It was not so much individuals on the bench line. And so the food industry copied that because now they could get more food products out. And in one sense, it's a good thing because you can get more food products out and you decrease the cost. So it becomes more available to people. Um, I think President Hoover in his actual president, well, before he became the president, in his campaign, one of his um, aims was a chicken in a pot for everyone and a car in everyone's garage. <laughs> so, so trying to mass produce food was a big thing back then just to make it more affordable. And so that was the mentality, like, let's decrease costs, everyone can afford it. And if we if everyone can afford it, then we're trying to like, equalize everyone decrease poverty. But at the same time, the role of nutrient density in food wasn't taken into consideration. So now we've got heaps and heaps and heaps of cheap products out there. And of course, to, to end up with these cheap products, you got to also manufacture cheap ingredients, where nutrient density is not necessarily taken into consideration. Plus, we've also still thinking food safety. Um, and so now we've got all these products flooding the market, TV meals, snack products, you know, chips, lollies, all those sort of things. And then we're seeing this high increase in chronic health diseases that we never had before, like diabetes and cholesterol and heart disease. Um, and so that's kind of, you know, that's been the main driver in the food industry. And, you know, that's evolved. And we've got things like artificial intelligence that is now used to, to automate decisions. Um We've, you know, got fair trade agreements and globalization and multinational markets that we're working in. So these are all different pressures that the food industry has had to contend with. But the underlying principle of mass production, getting lots of food out there, keeping it safe so that you don't have food poisoning um, and keeping the cost down has been the underlying driver. But now we're entering food revolution 4.0, which is nutrition and health innovation. So it doesn't matter what you do, whether you make a baby formula or a vegan patty or a new variety of milk or a fermented protein, whatever it is, health has to actually be the crux of that decision, that innovation, that product development, because we know more. Um, nutrition is now definitely established as a, a very cool science. We know that nutrition is not just about weight loss and body image, but nutrient density in food is absolutely essential. It is the fuel that, that fuels our bodies. Um, too much of a good thing can lead to health problems and too little of a good thing can lead to health problems. So how do we create food supplies, whether it be processed or, you know, natural straight off farm in which health is the underlying ethos? And that's where we're heading in that direction. So where are we in that journey? Um, and I guess it's probably worth digging in a bit deeper to the food or nutrition related diseases and the impacts on our societies at the moment as well 
Yeah. So in, in terms of where we are in that journey, um, I think for the first time in history, we're starting to work together, the food and the nutrition world for quite a long time. Nutrition, you know, when nutrition was initially a science way back 220 years ago, it was a science. It had its own category like astronomy, physiology, biology, and nutrition was a science alongside chemistry. And then over time, especially into the you know 1950s, nutrition kind of became this dietetics mode of operation where it was used for disease treatment because people had diabetes or heart disease or whatever it was. Um, and the science of nutrients and its role in food architecture or how food architecture affects nutrients in the food and our digestive tract, how we actually absorb it, was kind of shelved <laughs> maybe not shelved but the the direction and the focus on it was a bit lost um by 2000 i think 2012 is when the gut microbiome officially got organ status so that's a you know our newest organ to the human body is that gut microbiome and with its discovery and you know this is not just some bacteria living down in our colon but it is an organ and there's a whole bunch of them and, and the role of what they do, um, it, you know, the, the role of the colon is no more just about fermenting waste so that it's easy to pass out of our body, but these bacteria ferment whatever we can't absorb and they produce metabolites and those metabolites are absorbed through the colon wall and, and they go on to cause all sorts of different actions in the body both good sometimes not so good so our understanding of the human digestive tract our understanding of bioavailability of nutrients bioaccessibility of nutrients so bioaccessibility is is if we've got nutrients trapped inside of food like say carotene in carrots what are the factors that prevent that carotene from being absorbed so the dietary fiber the cell wall how fast our our, our enzymes can break things down those factors are being researched being discovered and it's 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 becoming more well known and so marrying that knowledge with an understanding of nutrients with an understanding of food density like the actual quality of the food. And that starts all the way on farm, you know, so how we feed that cow or the, the fertilizer in the soil, um, the water supply, or, you know, you've even got fermenters. So the really cool high-tech ways of, of producing food using microbial fermentation or, um, you know, the alternate proteins and how they're growing them, cell culture and stuff like that. Right at that level where we're producing the food supply, and then you need to take it to the next level where we're processing it. The technologies that are used along that whole spectrum right up until the guest in my mouth are starting to be modified based on our understanding of the human digestive tract and how powerful we are. So when just for the, the lay person, when you buy a product at the supermarket or the grocery store and you look at the label and it will have fat, salt, sugar, protein, fiber. You may have one or two vitamins uh, or one or two other minerals, but there's a handful of things there. Um, if you actually go and dig a bit deeper, I think there's 12 or 13 vitamins and there's a certain similar number of what's deemed essential minerals. But as we learn more, how many actual important nutrient molecules are we talking about? Is it... 10 is it 50 is it 100 is it a thousand or we don't know no not 10 15 or 20 um every component in food has an important role to play and some things are considered nutrients and some things are considered non-nutrients so nutrients by default are things that the body it needs to prevent micronutrient deficiencies or, or macronutrient deficiencies whatever will prevent a deficiency disease so for example if a person doesn't have enough protein but they've got enough carbohydrates or fat, they can end up with a condition called um, sarcopenia in the Western world. It's very common in um, the elderly because you see the muscle wastage, they don't have enough protein, and so you can't actually build muscle. Um, you see the same sort of thing in third world countries with those little kids with big bellies and they've got really skinny arms and skinny legs, but they've got these massive bellies, which is filled with, it's filled with gas. And so... Um, that condition is called kwashiorkor 
And essentially they just don't have enough protein. It's not that they're not eating enough calories. They actually are. They're eating lots of maize, but they just don't have enough protein. And protein is essential to break down carbohydrate. All right. So that's where the nutrient mentality came from. But now we've got also a whole bunch of compounds called non-nutrients, because if you don't have them, you won't end up with some sort of deficiency disease. Things like polyphenols, phytonutrients, anthocyanins, phenolic acids, um, they play a really important role in supporting the actions of the essential vital nutrients. So they play a really important role in backing those guys up. They do things in the body with like antioxidant activity, anti-carcinogenic activity, anti-mutagenic activity. So fighting DNA damage, but it's entirely based on dose. So you can't just take one, you know, pill of anthocyanins and think it's going to work. It's dose and it's consistency. And so we're understanding that this is all, it's new and it's evolving. Um, so whilst they don't have the essential status like the nutrient guys they are extremely important and and so foods nutrients don't nutrients and non-nutrients don't work in isolation of each other they actually enhance each other's absorption sometimes they can work to detract absorption as well so like say vitamin c actually helps with your non-e your your plant derived iron or non-heme iron it enhances your absorption of that um, but then we've also got phyto phytates in the in the plant cell wall in dietary fiber that decreases iron absorption so understanding how these things work together to both enhance absorption or detract absorption um, is absolutely essential and that's and we're still doing a lot of work in that so from a practical point of view um i guess not knowing all this information and i want to eat something that's good and healthy for me and has a mixture of these nutrients and other biologically active molecules how's the best way to approach that how do you how do you know one that you've got the the right balance of different foods but that your tomato or apple or carrot is actually one that's rich in these nutrients compared to one that's not so rich in these nutrients all right so really simple things that everyone can do is firstly eat mostly plants i'm not saying become a vegan or vegetarian but eat mostly plants. <laughs> so at least half of your plate should be plants. A quarter of your plate should be carbs and a quarter of your plate should be protein rich, whatever that is. Um, and the reason for eat mostly plants is because it's an amazing source of dietary fiber and your gut microbiome doesn't have the privilege of choosing its preferred meal of choice. And dietary fiber is its preferred meal of choice. So you got to feed them. Um, so mostly plants. Plants are a great source of your phytonutrients, vitamins, minerals, and lots of water, right? So it, it, it bulks you up. That's why you got to eat a lot off it because it's just got so much water and fiber in it. Um, whole grain carbohydrates, which means that the whole grain is there it's not being refined we haven't stripped it off its brand its germ um, which are really nutrient dense components um, and protein and that could be your tofu your eggs your meat your steak your chicken your fish whatever so that's like the simple rules really simple the second thing is eat lots of color so when you're looking at your plants if you got some green got some red got some orange got some purple got some white you've covered all your bases You've essentially covered all the essential nutrients and you've got all the range of different antioxidants and phytonutrients simultaneously. Um, so that's the important thing. And anyone can do that. Now, the next thing to look at is, and this, this is where it starts to affect price range because we need to actually try and roll out this level of regenerative farming and stuff like that out. Um, now, the research at the moment shows that like say if you do organic farming versus commercial farming in comparison in terms of total antioxidant capacity they are still very comparable but in the long term the impact of organic farming is definitely better for the soil's microbial count and that will affect eventually lead on to affecting the quality of nutrients in foods over a long period of time so my always suggestion is you know I would rather people eat food than be hung up on um, not getting the nutrients into their body because they're so fixated on I need to have organic or not. So for everybody, 
50% plants, a quarter whole grain, a quarter protein, and mostly plants and eat color. And anyone can do that regardless of their, their budget and their socioeconomic status. But if you want to go the next step and you want to think a bit deeper and you're thinking long-term and you also have the affordability to do it, um, one of the best ways to contribute to the sustainability of the planet is to actually think of how these products are raised and grown and produced and making sure that there are the the methods of farming and the methods of production, because we do have a lot of novel, novel technologies that are coming through, is regenerative and is sustainable. So there is no point in saying I have an organic farm if we're using three times the amount of water into that organic farm because the equation is out of whack. Something else is, is being lost at the same time. On the flip side, you have things like vertical farms, and vertical farms look super high tech and they, you know, there's these monstrosities of glass buildings that are five stories high and you've got five different layers of vegetables growing on a conveyor belt and it doesn't look like your traditional farming system. And yet it can be extremely energy efficient. It can be extremely water efficient. They don't necessarily use pesticides at all because they keep the pesticides out. They don't use fertilizer because they don't need to. The, the plants grow in a nutrient-dense solution. And so that's a high-tech system. And yet it actually produces, it can produce really nutrient-dense foods that have very long sustainability for the, the food supply and for the, the planet as well. So we've got to look at things in a really balanced perspective there's there's a lot of science in that and that's awesome information for once again back for for more a lay person is there anyone is there anyone actually creating labels or creating um like the british red tractor or something else that will help the average consumer know which box to um that food is in in terms of the nutrient density yeah, so nutrient density is a relatively new concept. Um, I mean, it's in the science world, we know it, but it's a new concept definitely in terms of the food industry. And it's a new concept for even a lot of healthcare professionals because um, not all nutrients are exactly the same. Not all proteins are the same. Not all fibers are the same. Not all carbs are the same. Not all fats are the same. Um, and so that's what I mean when I'm saying nutrient density. Um, at the moment, our food labeling largely is based on ingredient decks and on nutrition information panels. And so when you send a product off to a lab to test it for its nutrition information panel, there are, there are prerequisites. And we need to know total energy, we need to know total protein, total carbs, um, and total fats. And if you make claims, we can split that fat down into saturated, unsaturated, um, and trans and sodium. Those are what's required. If there is a claim, we will also test for I for dietary fiber, but it doesn't actually tell you much. I mean, it tells you some, it gives you some level of understanding. It's better than a completely misted it up mirror. We've got a, a slightly clear mirror here but it doesn't tell us what that type of protein is. And that's why we've got the conundrum starting to happen, especially with the rise of the plant alternatives. And so you've got like, say, an alternate milk, M-Y-L-K, a nut milk versus a dairy milk. And dairy milk is just milk. It's just one ingredient. And so they don't do a whole lot of marketing or research in what's actually in that milk. Um, Whereas the plant ones are actually made, they're formulated. So they've got to add, you know, 3% of almonds and water and some oil and um, stabilizers. And if they want, they can add the vitamins and minerals to it. So because they're adding stuff into that product, they will put that on the nutrition information panel. Whereas dairy milk doesn't add anything to it. So it doesn't really go into detail on the NIP. And here's the thing, the protein in say almonds, for example, or hemp or whatever it is, is actually a different type of protein to what's in dairy milk. 
in dairy milk, we've got casein, we've got whey and casein actually coagulates in the stomach. So it has, um, it makes you feel full for a longer period of time, which is really great for weight management. And you've got whey, which is super easy to, to absorb it. It's absorbed in your small intestine. So it's really great um, for growing children, for growing bodies, for bulking up, for muscles, those sort of things. Um, so that type of protein is very different to the types of proteins you're getting out of nuts. They behave differently in the body. And yet we're not actually putting that information out on packaging yet, just because that level of understanding needs to be translated in a way that the food industry can A, do, that labs can test, and three, the legislation needs to be created. Otherwise, we end up having... Um, either well-meaning companies or you know cowboys out there that can take advantage and manipulate the system so once the legislation is in place the legislation is super important to prevent or try and help consumers make informed choices and prevent um, misinformation from getting out to consumers and that's not yet there but it is definitely it will definitely be heading in that direction yeah there's there's a lot of innovation going into making new foods um, and be that the the meat alternatives, you know, there's a lot of, of growing different things of trying to get textures and a lot of um, investment and innovation is going there. Um, there's also the fact that probably over the last 30 or 40 years, the kind of mass produced, um, highly processed food market has tended to produce some of the least healthy things on our shelves. So how do you, I guess, balance that up internally and not turn your back on innovation because innovation is great, but also make sure you don't get taken down the garden path, so to speak? Yeah. Yeah, so it it's it is challenging, Ash, definitely. Um, yeah, this year alone, I think I've spoken in about 10 conferences on this exact same topic. Um, because it because for a long time nutrition has been seen as probably, you know, not I think nutrition hasn't been seen as a real science for a long time. It lost it's lost its credit and maybe not credibility, it lost its way in the whole weight loss movement um or it lost its perception in the whole weight loss movement and so for a long time we didn't actually have nutrition scientists working in the food industry um you got food scientists coming through food technologists great fantastic but people with nutrition expertise were not actually there and weren't at the table and now a lot of food companies are realizing, hey, we actually need these guys and creating in the opportunities in this space for them to be part of the process. Um, and that's a really great thing because we need to be there. Processing in itself is a technology. It's an enabler. It's the formulations that are usually the conundrum. And so thankfully, we're, we're getting people coming in into the food industry that have that understanding of nutrition as a science, um, how much of certain nutrients we need in foods that will have a beneficial impact on, on the human body. But we got to be also honest, there are products out there like nutrition is the sum total of everything we consume and drink. Okay. So I'm not going to say, I'm not going to demonize one particular food product or one particular sector of the supermarket. Um, marshmallows are definitely, you know, pretty much just aerated packets of sugar. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with eating marshmallows as long as they are not the bulk of your diet. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with having a glass of red wine as long, again, as long as it doesn't take up 75% of what you should be drinking. You've also got to have water. You've got to have some, you know, you've got to have that. It's the, it's the balanced perspective and balanced perspective, balanced diet is both 100% accurate. And it's also the most frustrating thing because it doesn't tell anyone what balanced is. <laughs> we, we leave people up to their own devices and that's not fair either. Um, so the, you know, the aim for a healthy diet is the sum total. And when you take your step back and you look at your, you know, look at your diet for the whole day, don't even look at it for the whole week, just look at it for the whole day. And if it is in lots of packaging, 
and it doesn't have much dietary fiber and it doesn't have much color and everything looks fairly similar like a muesli bar looks pretty much the same color as a cookie which looks pretty much the same color as a muffin which doesn't look very dissimilar to a burger bun um okay then we've got we've got a slight problem here and you don't need me to tell you that <laughs> so just taking that step back and looking at your food because the more refined it is the more the nutrition the nutrients have been stripped out from it um, and so that's really important that everyone can keep that in mind. Can you have a croissant? Can you have a pastry or a pie? Yes. But where is that in the whole scheme of your diet? If that's a daily thing, then we got some issues that we need to look at. Why is that a daily thing? Is it because you lack cooking skills? Is it because you're, work, you're, you're a truck driver and you don't actually have the time to pack a meal and you don't know how to pack a meal that lasts six hours? Um, is it financial costs? And so it's, it's very simplistic to say you need to eat, you know, salad every day and a tin of tuna. Um, and, and yet maybe people don't have the, the resources, the accessibility, they, have, they may have allergens or whatever. So you've got to take the person into consideration. So what works for me may not necessarily work for you. Well, but the overall ethos of take a step back look at your meal, look at your daily food intake. Nutrition is the sum total of everything I consume. So if you're doing it right 70% of the time, you're eating mostly plants, lots of color, lots of dietary fiber, supplementing your meals with whole grains and some good quality lean protein. And for 30% of the time, you're having your marshmallows, you're having your crisp, you're having your red wine, you're having a croissant. Well, you, you've pretty much nailed it. Or how you you mentioned that you know people are different. How different actually are we? Oh, how different are we? Well, personalized nutrition is definitely going to be the next wave. It's one of the next waves coming. The more we know, the more the better we can do. Um, you know, the old thing is you don't know what you don't know, but we are knowing more about our genetics and how genetics plays an important role in metabolism of nutrients, um, our absorbability. And you got to think like. Humans overall, yes, we have very similar needs. We all have a brain, we have a stomach, we have a small intestine, we have a colon, we have arms, legs, and we move and we walk and we breathe. So from that perspective, we have very similar needs. But we also do know, and I'll use this as an example, we also do know that there are regions of the world that have lower levels of lactate, lactose intolerance. So their body is naturally able to manufacture lactase enzyme. And so people who are of European descent, you know, Australians, people in the UK, um, have the lowest rates of lactose intolerance in the world. Um, I think it's as low as only 5% of the Australian population have um, the inability to, of the European proportion of the Australian population, um, have the inability to produce lactase and it can get up to about 13% in places like um, some of the Nordic countries. But then you've got, you know, South America and, and parts of Africa where it can be between 40 to 50% of those population groups that are unable to produce lactase. And then you head into Asia and it can be as high as 90% of that population group that's unable to produce lactase. Now we're all still humans. And we all still have arms and legs and we all breathe oxygen and we all move and we still got the same digestive tract. How come in those parts of the world, they have more lactase in, uh, lactose intolerance versus say parts of Australia and Europe? So genetics does play a role, definitely. And we're definitely understanding more about genetics and the role that that takes in, in um, nutrient absorption. When a person does you know, nutrition work with me, I always look at all their bloods and because I want to see a what's in their bloodstream, but I also want to try and understand how their metabolic pathways work because your metabolism is going to be different to mine, not just because you're at a different stage of the life cycle, you're of a different ethnicity, um, you're a guy, I'm a girl, you probably got more lean muscle tissue than I do, but we do realize that, yeah, genetics is, is definitely a role. And so personalized nutrition is definitely coming. It's going to help us understand individuals in a greater way. Another interesting study I, I saw not so long ago was looking at insulin responses to different foods. And the two foods 
that were used in this trial were ice cream and sushi. And the trial showed that roughly 50% of the people got the big spike from ice cream, which probably no one would be surprised about. And roughly 50% of the other 50% got the big spike, not from the ice cream, but from the sushi. And the researchers concluded that was down to the gut microbiome, which, as you said, is the the latest organ to be added to to our body, Um, even though it's been there for millions of years. We just haven't really acknowledged it. But um, where does... Because the microbiome is not actually you. It's something that's living inside the body, so it does change. Um, how how fixed of that? How how much of that is diet driven? How much of it is hereditary or environmental? Or we still don't know the answers to many of those questions. Yeah. So the gut microbiome is a complex little little person who lives inside of us, <laughs> and we do know that the gut microbiome is affected from in utero so what your mom eats affects you um what your grandmother eats affects you um so that's that's how far back we can go in terms of genetics right so what mom eats affects the baby growing on the inside of her and the birth methodology also affects it so babies who are born via cesarean because it's very sterile right you gotta think like this is literally an operation we keep everything super clear and clean And so those little ones, when they come out, they don't have the natural, um, I guess, contamination that happens during um, vaginal birth. Coming through the vaginal canal, there is microbes there, there's bacteria. And so they get contaminated, so to speak. (laughs) This is their first introduction. Because in utero, it's absolutely sterile. So when you come out through the birth canal, that's their contamination process. And they're exposed to their mom's bacteria which is the first way of being exposed. Whereas kids who are born through cesarean are not exposed that way. Now, is that a, is that a beneficial thing? Can, how do we do this? I don't want all the moms out there to go, Oh my gosh, I didn't do the right thing for my baby. No, no, just, just calm down. This is just ways in which we get exposed to bacteria. Okay. So that's a, what she eats. And secondly, how they're born. And thirdly, even breast milk. So breast milk actually can provide some antibodies and stuff like that through breast milk, and that can help to colonize the gut microbiome. Um, But then you've also got bacteria on skin and skin to skin contact causes that as well. Now, unfortunately, and I used to work in infant formula, there's a lot of babies and a lot of moms out there who can't breastfeed for whatever reason. And so now we're seeing great because we realize that this is happening with breast milk how can we actually make it commercially available um so there's a lot of companies out there that have probiotic drops that you can add to your formula to actually help with that colonization for bob um which is again brilliant making that possible and spe- expediating that process so that's you know early stage when we're really young Once you start introducing a kid to solids, that's when the fun starts starts happening because bacteria grow off the the substrates that they're given. And essentially their favorite food is anything fibrousy. They'll eat everything. Anything that is not absorbed in your small intestine is what they get to eat. So if you are lactose intolerant, um, using that as an example, you don't have the lactase enzymes to, to split the lactose molecule up. So it's, it doesn't get absorbed in your small intestine. That's why it ends up in the colon. And then these bugs fermented and produce the bloating and the cramps and the diarrhea. That's really uncomfortable. And that's only because it's landed in the colon. It hasn't been absorbed. Um, so they'll eat everything, but just because they can eat everything doesn't mean it's good for them. So different foods that we feed them, resistant starch, um, fermentable fibers, soluble fibers, things like that, that actually helps different species to grow, helps population numbers to grow, and that's what's super important. If you're ever on antibiotic, well, then, yeah, you're going to destroy the bad bugs in your body that's causing infection, but you will also negatively impact your good bacteria. Um, and so that's why it's recommended that yes you do take a probiotic at least half an hour or an hour after you've done your antibiotic it is not going to repopulize your gut microbiome but it's going to strengthen your bugs that are there because they're taking a whack from the antibiotics and they need all the help that they can get Um, things like eating fermented foods like yogurt 
Now, yoga is fascinating because, yes, it's got live bacteria in it, but you got to realize the human body is actually pretty hardcore. You've got to get through the stomach, which has got a pH of 1.8. You've got to get through um, six meters of small intestine. Six meters, that's the size, that's the height of an adult male giraffe. So it's intense. And it starts off at about a pH six and it ends up all the way at about a pH five and a half. And you've got enzymes hitting you at all different lengths of that small intestine. So the, the bacteria in yogurt have to survive that process. And then you end up in the colon and you've got about 1.8 meters of colon to work through. And so right at the start, it's about 1.8 pH of 1.8. And by the end, it can get up to about three or four, which is not ideal because that's when carcinogens and, and pathologic bacteria grow. And that's where we see a lot of colon cancers happening down the, down, down the end of the colon. So you want to keep whatever you're getting in that colon being able to reach all the way to the end bacteria so that they can ferment it. That's why fiber is amazing. But yogurt is amazing because the bacteria seem to be protected in the protein matrix. And so they're not easily destroyed by the gut microbiome, uh, by the, the pH in the stomach. So when you are taking a probiotic, and I tell this to everybody, and America is actually really good because you've got quite a few products that do this, microencapsulated probiotics are essential. It's one thing to take a probiotic that's got billions and billions and billions of numbers. You gotta realize it's got to get through the stomach and every, the stomach is designed to kill things. <laughs> So microencapsulated means that it's the little bacteria are, are trapped inside a little teeny tiny sphere. One thing you one thing you brought up was, I guess the the physical size and shape of things, like whether it's microencapsulation or whether it's you you've mentioned how things are wrapped up or packaged. How how important is the physical structure of food to your health and well-being very important i mean yeah okay firstly i realize we cannot forget we've got this incredible factory inside of our body and that's called our digestive system and our digestive system starts in our mouth so this and my teeth <laughs> is actually part of the process. So particle size starts up in your mouth, breaking it down, chewing it up. If it is not small enough, you can't get the nutrients out of it. Point blank. The end. Um, and so that makes it harder for your small intestine to absorb things, right? So you got to chew properly. There is actually some truth in that old saying that you got to chew 12 times or 16 times. <laughs> There's actually a lot of science to back that up. Um, because the smaller the particle size is, it means that your stomach can actually digest it and break it down even further. We're talking about particles on the nanoscale. Now we don't eat nanoscale anything. Okay. And so if you're talking about, say, an apple or a carrot, you mean the little cells that are inside, they're at the nano scale. So it's, a, it's, it, you might be able to see it like in a segment of an orange. You know, you can see those yeah, yeah. tiny little sacks. That's where the nutrients lie. But they've got to get out of that fibrous little pocket. Same sort of thing when you're talking about protein or carbs or, or you know, like protein rich foods and things like that. So that we're talking at a very tiny scale. So our digestive system is really important in breaking those cells down, dismantling protein molecules. So when you eat a steak or you drink some milk, um, you know, like think about a steak, for example, a piece of fish or even tofu, like you're talking about a chunk here. Protein at, 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 under a microscope actually looks like balls of wool. That's what it actually looks like. And so the, the acid in your stomach actually uncoils that ball of wool. So we don't see those balls of wool. We just see this chunk of tofu or cheese. It uncoils it. And then you've got specific enzymes that come along and snip it into its amino acids. And the amino acids are what is absorbed by our small intestine across the wall. So that's why particle size is actually really important. If you chew up properly, <laughs> you give your stomach a better chance of breaking it down <laughs> and you give your small intestine a better uh, the ability to absorb more. Okay, so that's firstly really important. Um, when we're talking about processing, now processing gets a lot of, you know, it does get the negative route, but you have to also look, there's applications, and this is where individuals come into play. 
As we get older, we do know that we do produce a little bit less stomach acid. Um, and so older people in particular, and they're prone to sarcopenia, you'll notice, and you, you probably notice with your, your elderly relatives and friends, they don't want to eat steak. They want soft proteins. They want chicken. They want fish. They want eggs because it's, they say it's easy for their teeth. And in theory, it is actually easy for their teeth because it's softer. And they also say it's, it's I don't feel so full also true so because it's a softer protein it's easier for their aging digestive system to break down and here's where some really cool technologies can actually be used to help them out so there's things like high pressure processing which is exactly that really 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 high levels of pressure that is applied to say a cheap cut of meat um, that's really sinewy and chewy and hard you put it into a high pressure processing machine it's just pressure we're just putting it into a pressure chamber and it softens all those sinews down and it makes it like extremely easy to digest in the human body so you can take something like that cheap cut of meat put in a hpp um zap it in a under some really high pressure just for a couple of minutes and you create something that is excruciatingly tenderized and tastes amazing um, it's a great eating experience but we're creating products for people who have digestive issues that they can actually now eat these types of products they don't have to eliminate it from their diet hpp can also be used to preserve products so same sort of deal i can put milk in hpp instead of pasteurizing it which is heat treatment to destroy pathological bacteria you can put high pressure processing milk into a high pressure processing tank and um you save all of the bioactive components you don't destroy any of the beneficial bacteria so we've got technologies there that actually can enhance nutrition, um, that can enhance our absorbability, especially through different stages of the life cycle. Um, so the food matrix definitely does play a very, very, very important role. But if you're in, overall a generally a healthy person, you know, you're, you don't have any diseases, you don't have any ill health, um, your bowel motility is working really well. And, you know, bowel motility, I know this is really crazy, but <laughs> my expertise is understanding pooping. <laughs> so you shouldn't strain, you know, by the time you enter the toilet and the time it takes for you to empty your bowels and leave should be no more than five minutes. It should be that simple. Mm -hmm. It should look like a sausage. And if it does all of that, you know that you've got a good bowel motility. And so you're healthy. And so your digestive tract can handle quite a lot. Wonderful. Um, is there anything else? There's there's a lot we've covered. Is there anything else you think that we've missed that you would like to add? I think um, one thing I will add is that, you know, nutrition is the bee's knees and everyone wants to understand more about nutrition, which is fantastic because like truthfully, it is the fuel of the human body. Um, and if you treat your body right, it will take care of you. The human body is extremely resilient. So even if you treat it badly, it will try and correct the wrongs that you're doing, but it can only go so far. Um, so it does rely on us to make good choices for it. Your gut microbiome, point number two, your gut microbiome is like a little baby. It's a little person who lives inside your colon. There's millions of them and they all have personality. They have emotions. They like certain foods as well. Um, so if it's good, if it's healthy for you, it's going to be healthy for them. So marshmallows are a treat for you. Marshmallows are a treat for them too. <laughs> okay? So just think of them in that perspective. Um, and the third thing, like, I think food is both one of the coolest sciences in the world. It is a science because it touches on anatomy, it affects physiology, it affects chemistry, it affects psychology and how our brain functions and our emotions. Um, it is affected by biology. It is affected by microbiology. It's affected by physics. So it is a really cool science. But because it is easily accessible to everyone, we all have to eat. It unfortunately has lost its um, specialness, its uniqueness, its importance. We give more credibility to rocket scientists um, than we do to nutrition scientists because everybody eats and it's common 
and I can go to the shops and buy whatever I want to eat and that makes me an expert. Unfortunately, it doesn't. Just like building a rocket from Lego does not make me a rocket scientist. <laughs> um, just because we all eat food does not make us experts in nutrition. And so I think it's super important for consumers to try and make sure you assess the information you get. It has to be from credible information because unfortunately everybody's trying to get onto the nutrition bandwagon and it is causing more problems, especially in the long term. What you do now is setting your body up for tomorrow. It is setting your body up for five years down the track. It is setting your body up for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years down the track. And it also is going to affect your future children. So the thing with preventative health, it's not something we can actually measure because our benchmark is not getting sick. <laughs> yep. So whereas if you've got diabetes or, or some sort of chronic disease or anemia, I can put you on a, a diet and we can give you a whole bunch of supplements and then we can track how you improve. Whereas prevention is not like that. Okay. We're not trying to stop a sickness that's in your body, we're trying to prevent that from happening. And so if you keep that in mind, what you do now is what your future body is going to thank you for or not thank you for, <laughs> puts things into perspective. So, you know, make sure you, the information you're getting is from really important, really good, credible sources. And the last point I'd like to say is that supplements are not evil. Um, I know a lot of people think that supplements, you know, we should always get all of our nutrition from food. And, you know, at one stage in my life, when I was early in my career, I used to be that way as well. And, and, and it's true. It is true. If you're eating all the right stuff um, and you're eating the variety and you're eating for you, you're, for your body, I'm not eating for you, Ash, I'm eating for me. Um, you should get all your nutrients. That's 100% accurate. But the truth is we also live in a busy world and we've also got external pressures on our lives and we've got, you know, um, forces and stresses and anxieties. And I don't always have time to eat smoke, you know, salmon three times a week. So taking an omega-3 supplement is not a bad thing at all. But if you're going to take supplements, you got to make sure you take them at, at a, a level that will have a biological response. You have to make sure that you're not going to overdose because that can also cause problems. And you don't just go to the shop and just pick a whole bunch of supplements and just take it for the hell of it. Make sure you see a healthcare professional and get your bloods tested. And then they will give you the right thing that you should be taking if you need it. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so very, very much for, for all, all your insight and knowledge and sharing that with us today. Thank you very much, Annalyn. Uh, thanks, Ash, so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. You've been listening to The Ash Cloud with me, Ash Sweeting, in conversation with Annaline Padayachi from the University of Queensland, recorded in California in September 2022.